eating disorders as a disease are just inundated with fact and fiction. Many people today believe that eating disorders are a relatively recent phenomenon, and yet they have their roots going back thousands of years. In fact, we know as early as 2500 BC, the Egyptians were drawing hieroglyphics depicting monthly purging to ward off illness. Well, time goes by, and about the time of Christ, we know that ancient Romans went to lavish banquets, banquets and gorged on food. And then they would supposedly go off to a room called the vomitorium, purge, and return to the things. Well, it's absolutely a fact that banquets took place, but a vomitorium is actually just a Latin phrase for an ingress or ingress into an ancient Roman theater or Colosseum. Well, time goes by, and finally in the 1680s, the Dr. John Morton in England for the first time records an eating disorder as a type of illness. Now, time at this point starts to speed up a bit, and we know now that Sir William Gold in 1873 records the term anorexia in a medical journal for the first time. Well, an interesting side note <coughs> is that rumors persist to this day that he either knew the identity of Jack the Ripper or he himself but we now go to 1900. This is a picture of a person suffering from an eating disorder, anorexia, at that time. And the medical industry, for the first time, diagnosed eating disorders as a physical, a physical disease related to a medical condition, a hormonal imbalance, or an endocrine deficiency. And they were going in the right direction. But advancement and progress could not be made because technology did not exist at that time. And as a result, modern medicine came into play and got away from the biological causes of this disease. So how is eating just orders being treated today. Well, we know that it's being done largely through talk therapy and different types of counseling via the Maudsley method or FBT or CBT or DBT, and then there's a dizzying array of prescription drugs, uh, particularly benzodiazepines, Clonopin, Xanax, Adam, that treat the symptomology of the disease, not the cause, not the uh, disease itself, but the symptoms. Now let's look at how effective the treatment is today. We know for treatment-resistant eating disorders today, one-third of our patients will die, one-third will be chronically ill their whole life, and about one-third will recover some type of functionality. And I believe that is not sufficient. I believe that we have too many people afflicted by this disease. We need to come up with a blank slate. We need to be more progressive in our thinking and the advancement of technology to address this disease. Now, I'm often asked, Steve, how prevalent is this disease? Well, there are about 325 million people in the U.S. United States, of whom about 29 million live here in the great state of Texas. And that 29 million number is significant because that's approximately the same number of people who have or will have an eating disorder in their lives. Imagine every person you run, run into today, or every person in the St. Patrick's Day Parade or the American Airlines Center for the basketball games, every man, woman, child in every home state of Texas has this disease. The next question I'm, I'm often asked is, how severe is this disease? Well, I could go into numerous statistics, but I'll just go into two. The first one is, 
that eating disorders had the highest mortality rate out of all mental illnesses. And two, every 62 minutes, someone dies as a direct result of an eating disorder. One an hour. And while statistics are statistics, they're a number until they're not. Until it impacts you or involves you or involves you. And on, on October 30th, 2016, it happened to me that my 23-year-old daughter, Morgan, died after a seven-year fight with eating disorders. That is the reality of this disease. It crosses all racial, gender, and socioeconomic boundaries. It takes us all. And yet society, for the most part, seems rather ignorant. And even our medical industry is ambivalent about it. Let's, let's, let's look at that last point. We know that in an average three-year medical program, our doctors are receiving on average one hour of eating disorder training. Three years, one hour. Imagine that everybody in this auditorium today is receiving one-fourth of the training our doctors receive during their medical residency. In 2012, the American Medical Association had an optional 17-minute online course on eating disorder that it offered its members. 0.04% bothered to even educate themselves. That means for every 1,000 medical professionals in the AMA, four bothered to educate themselves. And of even more concern, this past week, the medical ambivalence hit the North Texas community especially hard. One of the oldest established eating disorder programs in North Texas, if not the entire state of Texas, Texas Health Resource and Presbyterian Hospital, announced they were closing their doors after being open for more than 20 years. And it's not because of a lack of patience or people who need help. And so, our general practitioners, our pediatricians, our primary care physicians, who should be on the first line of defense, are ill-equipped to recognize, diagnose, and treat this disease. Now, part of the title of my talk is Let There Be Light, and I believe that the first light of illumination has to be a mandatory increase in education in our medical schools and training programs for our doctors so they are better equipped to handle this disease. We have a given problem to solve, people, and we need to take the bold solution. And yes, there's always a risk that we will fail or we won't solve the problem initially, but unless we take a bold solution, it's a certainty that we will fail. So let's look at a possible bold solution. The, one of the last great mysteries in the medical industry is the brain. It's an enigma. It's a mystery. We don't know so much about the brain. And yet, it is a key to the recovery from an eating disorder. Our research scientists believe that there is a dysfunctional development, a hormonal imbalance, a lack of electrical, electrical activity in certain areas of the brain. For example, uh, it starts in the in, in insula, you see the part of the brain, that processes feelings of hunger. And as a person, depending on the type of eating disorder they have, processes that. Then the anterior cingulate cortex becomes involved. And that is a part of the brain that's involved in decision making. You know, I've got a plate of food here in front of me. I'm going to choose to eat it or not. And finally, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex part of the brain 
is in law, which regulates self-control. And as we can see, in people suffering from anorexia, there's a greater sense of self-control. I, I believe that. But with binge eating disorder or bulimia, there's less control. But what does that really look like in the brain of a person suffering from an eating disorder? And basically, you have a weak sense of self and a person's place in the world. Something is wrong with me. I do not fit in. I have to change my appearance and how I feel about myself. So I'm going to do that by dieting and purging and binging. In the meantime, the levels of protein in our blood and the neural circuitry in our brain are negatively impacted. And as people who are suffering from an eating disorder are receiving counseling, they hear this. Imagine words of affirmation, the very words you intended to save your life is being heard in this curtain of white blood. We must take steps to have that black noise out, to find a way biologically to address the brain and to find some solutions. And to do that, there's now an app on the market, an FDA cleared poly polychromatic light therapy device. In essence, what this does is uh, the device is put on a patient's head for up to 20 minutes and different types of light, red, blue, and near infrared are pulsed into the brain. Uh, the Cerescan brain, of course, is first uh, to determine a treatment baseline. And then <coughs> the process is designed to impact parts of the brain. And yet, how is that done? Basically, it's done through the process of photobiomodulation. With photo, of course, meaning light and bio, the brain modulation that we're trying to change or impact the brain. Now, we know that blue, red, and near infrared light penetrates the dermis in the skull and penetrates to certain levels of the brain. And the near infrared light is designed to stimulate the mitochondria in the brain cells, which release ATP and nitric oxide. The nucleus in brain cells then absorb nitric oxide and interacting with the cell ribosomes release oxytocin. Don't you mean? It releases anti-inflammatories, analgesics, immune boosters, endorphins. These things that are, that are being provided, we think, by prescription drugs are being done by this photobiomodulation, the impact is almost immediate. Now, this device is, has been tested on returning military vets with severe PTSD, with severe traumatic brain injury, and has been tested with some success. Now, there are other types of light therapies that have been used in England, let's say, to treat seasonal affective disorder and bulimia and depression. But this system is designed to go into those parts of the brain that not only eating disorders are believed to uh, be involved, but other mental illnesses as well. And this type of treatment empowers a person who has this severe disease to have more control over their recovery. They're not now exclusively dependent on doctors and counselors and prescription drugs and their parents. And that is so important for them to feel that empowerment. And most importantly, it gives them hope. It gives their family hope, their loved ones hope that we can overcome this. Um, one of my favorite quotes, but before we go, make, you know, make no mistake, this is not a cure at all. This disease is still going to continue to take lives, but this is a start. 
it's bold, it's stark, it might not initially work. We've got to explore it. One of my favorite quotes from Teddy Roosevelt is, it is far better to dare my things, to win glorious triumphs, than checkered with failure, than to take rank with the four spirits, neither enjoy much nor suffer much, for they live in the great twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. People, we need to have people of vision. People who challenge the status quo in everything they do to embrace this type of light therapy program. The old manner in which we treat this disease doesn't work and it's not sufficient. So for those who do challenge the status quo, who believe in challenging everything, help us. Be the voice for those voices who are silent once every 62 minutes and help us save lives. One precious life.